Hello! In this screencast, we will be covering the muddiest points of Electronic Properties 2 Intrinsic and Extrinsic Semiconductors. Some of the muddy points that we have collected from students are what are the differences between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors, what are the differences between n-type and p-type extrinsic semiconductors, how does temperature affect each type of semiconductor, what are the differences in the conductivity equation for intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors? And what is the relation of electron and electron hole mobility to conductivity? If you wish to skip to a particular section, just click one of the hyperlinks listed around here. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get started. Intrinsic semiconductors are semiconductors that are considered to have no dopants. In reality, this means that they have less than 10 to the 21st power impurity atoms per meter cubed, or less than 10 to the negative 6 power weight percent of impurities. The band structure for intrinsic semiconductors consists of a full valence band, followed by an energy gap of forbidden energy states, followed by a conduction band that is empty at a temperature of absolute zero. As soon as you have a temperature ab above absolute zero, thermal energy is going to cause an electron to jump from the valence band to the conduction band, leaving behind an electron hole. Because of this, we have electron hole pairs. In other words, the number of negative charge carriers that we have is equal to the number of positive charge carriers, which we often refer to as the intrinsic charge carrier density. Since thermal energy is the cause of the creation of electron hole pairs, if we increase the temperature, the conductivity is going to increase because we'll have more charge carriers by having more electron hole pairs. The energy gap of an intrinsic semiconductor is constant and usually between 0.1 and 2 electron volts. So the energy gap here between 0.1 to 2 electron volts energy gap difference. Intrinsic semiconductors can either be elemental semiconductors or they can be compound semiconductors. Some good examples of each would be that a group 4 elemental semiconductor might be something like silicon, where a compound semiconductor could consist of group 3 plus group 5, which could be gallium arsenide. For an intrinsic semiconductor like silicon, an electron hole pair is created when thermal energy causes an electron to jump from the valence band to the conduction band. This electron hole pair creation can be seen here. Once we've applied an electric field with a positive and negative bias, the electron hole is going to move towards the negative bias by a valence electron jumping into this available bound state. This is why electron holes are considered to be positive charge carriers because they move towards the negative bias. Simultaneously, we have the free electron moving towards the positive bias. In the third picture here, we can see the hole move even closer to the negative bias by again another electron jumping into the available bound state. Again, also, we have the negative charge carrier, the free electron, moving towards the positive bias. The free electron can move much easier in the conduction band than the electron hole can move in the valence band. For this reason, the mobility of electrons is higher than the mobility of holes. Unlike intrinsic semiconductors, extrinsic semiconductors use impurity atoms to contribute extra charge carriers. The first type of extrinsic semiconductor we're going to talk about are p-type. For p-type, the impurity atoms have one less valence electron than the host. In other words, they are going to contribute an electron hole for every impurity atom added. The majority charge carriers are electron holes, and the minority charge carriers are going to be the electrons. This means that a large portion of the conductivity is contributed by electron holes and only a small portion is contributed by the electrons. The contributed electron holes from the dopant atoms are often referred to as acceptor states. In the band structure over here, we have our valence band followed by an energy gap and then the conduction band. This energy level right here is the acceptor energy level such that 
the valence electrons can easily jump to the acceptor energy level because there is a small difference between the energy levels here. Once all of the acceptor states have been filled, we refer to this as a state of saturation. At room temperature, there is more than enough thermal energy for all acceptor states to be filled. A good example of a p-type semiconductor would be group 3 boron impurity atoms within a silicon host. The reason this is a good example is because being in group 3, boron is going to have one less valence electron than the group 4 silicon. For the example of boron impurity atoms within a silicon host, we can see this is the electron hole that's contributed by the boron impurity atom. With the energy levels, we can see that the valence electrons can easily access the energy level of this dopant atom, such that when we have applied an electric field with a positive and negative bias, the valence electrons are going to want to move to the energy level of the dopant atom and have the positive charge carrier, the electron hole, moving towards the negative bias. Another type of extrinsic semiconductor is the n-type semiconductor. For n-type, the impurity atoms have one more valence electron than the host. For this reason, the majority charge carriers are going to be the electrons, and the minority charge carriers are going to be the electron holes. This means that a large portion of the conductivity is contributed by electrons, and only a small portion of the conductivity is contributed by electron holes. The contributed electrons from n-type dopants are referred to as donor states. Over here in the band structure, we have the valence band, followed by an energy gap, and then a conduction band. The energy level here represents the donor energy level of the dopant atoms, such that the electrons contributed by the dopant atoms can easily access the conduction band and become free electrons. The conduction band is easily accessible because there is a small difference in energy levels here. Once every donated electron is in the conduction band, we refer to this as a state of exhaustion. At room temperature, there is more than enough thermal energy for every donated electron to move to the conduction band and achieve a state of exhaustion. A good example of an n-type semiconductor would be phosphorus, which is group 5, impurity atoms, within a silicon host, which is group 4. The reason this is a good example is because being in group 5, phosphorus has one more valence electron than silicon, which is in group 4. Using the example of a phosphorus impurity atom within a silicon host, we can see the extra donated electron here. The energy level of the dopant atom and the energy level of the conduction band have a very small difference, such that it's easy for the donated electron to become a free electron by moving to the conduction band. Once we have an electric field applied with a positive and negative bias, this free electron is going to move towards the positive bias because it is a negative charge carrier. So what exactly is the relationship between temperature and the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor? In this graph, we can see the relationship between the intrinsic carrier concentration with respect to temperature in Kelvin for an intrinsic silicon semiconductor. The intrinsic carrier density is proportional to the exponent of negative energy gap divided by 2 times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. From this relationship we can see that increasing the temperature increases the intrinsic carrier concentration, which makes sense because more thermal energy creates more electron hole pairs. Since the conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor is proportional to the intrinsic carrier concentration, an increase in the carrier density is going to cause an increase in conductivity. So overall, increasing the temperature of an intrinsic semiconductor increases the conductivity because there are more charge carriers. If we look at this relationship after taking the logarithm of the conductivity with respect to the inverse of the temperature, we have 
a linear correlation such that the natural log of the conductivity is equal to sigma naught minus the energy gap divided by 2 times the Boltzmann constant multiplied by 1 divided by the temperature. When we compare this to the general form of a linear equation, y equals a plus bx, we can see that the y-intercept is equal to sigma naught, the slope is equal to negative energy gap divided by 2 times the Boltzmann constant, and our independent variable is the 1 divided by temperature, which we can see here on the independent axis. The slope of this linear relationship is negative the energy gap difference divided by 2 times the Boltzmann constant. Using this linear relationship in the logarithmic form, we can determine the energy gap of different intrinsic semiconductors. So now, what is the effect of temperature on the conductivity of extrinsic semiconductors? In this graph here, we have a comparison between the conduction electron concentration between n-type doped and undoped, or intrinsic, uh, semiconductors. In the first portion of the graph, we have the freeze-out region, which means there's not enough thermal energy for dopant activation. So you can see here that the conduction electron concentration is not very high at all until you start building up the temperature. The second region is called the extrinsic region, where you have a limited temperature effect on extrinsic conductivity. The reason you have a limited effect um, due to temperature is because the number of electron hole pairs created by thermal energy is minuscule compared to the amount of charge carriers that have been donated by the impurity atoms. The third and final region we call the intrinsic region. Um, an increase in temperature increases the thermal energy uh, creating a large enough number of electron hole pairs to have an impact on the conduction electron concentration. The next topic is to talk about the conductivity equation for intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. For intrinsic semiconductors, the conductivity is equal to a contribution from the negative charge carriers, or the electrons, and a contribution from the positive charge carriers, which are the electron holes. In the case of an intrinsic semiconductor, the concentration of negative charge carriers, the electrons, is equal to the concentration of the positive charge carriers, which are the electron holes, which we refer to then as the intrinsic carrier density. For this reason, we can simplify the conductivity equation to be that the conductivity equals the intrinsic carrier density multiplied by the electric charge constant multiplied by the summation of the electron mobility and the hole mobility. For a p-type extrinsic semiconductor, impurity atoms donate electron holes, so much so that the concentration of positive charge carriers is significantly greater than the concentration of negative charge carriers. For this reason, we can neglect the contribution to the conductivity from the electrons and approximate our conductivity equation such that the conductivity is approximately equal to the positive carrier density multiplied by the electric charge constant multiplied by the hole mobility. We use the hole mobility instead of the electron mobility because we are dealing with positive charge carriers, which are electron holes. Example 1, p-type conductivity. What is the conductivity of silicon containing 3.13 times 10 to the 21st power boron dopant atoms per meter cubed? Silicon has an electron mobility of 0.14 meters squared per volt second and a hole mobility of 0.05 meters squared per volt second. Because the dopant atoms are boron within a host silicon, the boron atoms have one less valence electron than silicon does. For this reason, we're dealing with a p-type semiconductor. Instead of using the full conductivity equation, we can approximate the conductivity by the positive charge carrier density multiplied by the electric charge constant multiplied by the hole mobility. The information regarding the hole mobility and the positive charge carrier density was provided in the problem, so when we plug in the values into our conductivity equation, we get that the conductivity of boron doped silicon is approximately 25.04 inverse ohm inverse meter. 
For an n-type extrinsic semiconductor, the impurity atoms donate electrons, such that the concentration of negative charge carriers is significantly greater than the concentration of positive charge carriers. For this reason, we can neglect the contribution from the positive charge carriers and approximate our conductivity such that the conductivity of n-type ex extrinsic semiconductors is approximately equal to the negative charge carrier density multiplied by the electric charge constant multiplied by the electron mobility. Again, we're going to use the electron mobility instead of the whole mobility because we are focusing on the negative charge carriers or the free electrons. Example 2, n-type conductivity. What is the conductivity of silicon containing 3.13 times 10 to the 21st power phosphorus dopant atoms per meter cubed? Silicon has an electron mobility of 0 0.14 meter squared per volt second and a hole mobility of 0 0.05 meter squared per volt second. Because we have phosphorus dopants inside of a silicon host, our impurity atoms have one more valence electron so we know we have an n-type semiconductor. Therefore, we can simplify the conductivity equation and approximate our conductivity as the negative charge carrier density multiplied by the electric charge constant multiplied by the electron mobility. Both the electron mobility and the negative charge carrier density have been provided by them in the problem. So when we plug in the values into our simplified equation, we get that the conductivity of phosphorus doped silicon is approximately equal to 70.11 inverse ohm inverse meter. In comparison, this n-type conductivity is greater than the p-type conductivity even though they have the exact same dopant level. This is because the electron mobility is always larger than the hole mobility. In addition, extrinsic conductivity is about four orders of magnitude greater than intrinsic conductivity because we have more charge carriers. This concludes the screencast on electronic properties to intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. We talked about the differences between intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductors. We also talked about distinguishing between n-type and p-type extrinsic semiconductors based off of which type of dopant atoms you have. We talked about the effects of temperature on both intrinsic and extrinsic semiconductor definitely affects the conductivity of intrinsic, not so much for extrinsic. We discussed the differences in the conductivity equation for both the intrinsic semiconductor and both the p-type and n-type extrinsic semiconductors. And we talked about the relation of electron and electron hole mobility to the conductivity of semiconductors. Hope this screencast was helpful. Don't forget to check out the first part, Electronic Properties 1. Um, you can get to it from the link here. And stay tuned for part 3, which will be about semiconductor devices.